Welcome to a special coast-to-coast -coast edition of Cube Conversations. Uh, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org from the Marlboro, Massachusetts office. Uh, Going to be talking about networking in hyperscale environments. Uh, at Wikibon, we've been talking about how hyperscale, uh, you know, is greatly affecting infrastructure and also how that, uh, you know, is potentially going to bleed into uh, enterprise environments. Uh, joining me for this segment is Mike Jockamson. Uh, Mike is the Director of Product Marketing over at Emulex, and he joins us from our Palo Alto office. Uh, Mike, uh, thanks for joining us on theCUBE. Hi, Hi, thanks, Stu. It's nice, nice to uh, be here and talk, talk with you today. today. Uh, Great. So, Mike, uh, you know, first of all, you know, I, I know, you know, terminology-wise, you know, we know what hyperscale is. You know, I, when I talk about it, uh, you know, it, it's usually kind of the, those largest, kind of ten to twenty, you know, companies. Many of them started the web. So, companies like Yahoo and Facebook, uh, the big cloud guys like Google and Microsoft, uh, and of course, Amazon can't be left out. Um, you know, wh wh why, from from an Emulex standpoint, is, is hyperscale uh, something that you know caught your attention, and how does it, how does that? Uh, start that conversation off for us. Sure. sure. The, the the hyperscale companies, as you mentioned, are driving a lot of innovation in networking today. They're all building their own environments from scratch, and whether it's open source software, they're building their own computers, uh, specking them out and having them built directly by the ODMs. They're looking at open compute as, as a standard server platform. And all of that bleeds over into the networking as well. So there's innovation going on across the entire stack because of this hyperscale community and the unique needs that they have in applications and networking. And that's attracted to us to the, the opportunity there because they, they present a new market opportunity. In fact, they present as if they're an OEM themselves because they are buying co raw components and building their own infrastructure. So. Yeah, uh, th 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 that's a great point, Mike. And boy, you, you had a lot of statements in there, and I think we're going to spend some time unpacking that. Uh, many people might not know what an ODM is, and uh, Open Compute's new to many of them, uh, too. So, um, you know, absolutely, uh, I, I think we're seeing innovation is starting at these largest companies from a networking standpoint. Yes. Uh, it's always been some of the big companies that have, that have helped driven forward. Uh, you know, some of the, the new generations of architecture. So, uh, you know, as we could do speed bumps, uh, you know, from 10 gig to 100 gig and, and beyond, uh, you know, there's needed to be some of those big companies that help drive that. Um, and it's not necessarily just speeds, uh, you know, speeds and feeds, but, you know, new new ways of building things, new ways of operating models. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm wondering if you can help us kind of compare and contrast conversations you have with some of the hyperscale players uh, versus the conversation happening in the enterprise today. Absolutely. What we see in the hyperscale community, I mentioned this, build your own, it stems from the fact that these guys have probably one or two key application workloads that are driving their networking needs. And therefore, they can design an infrastructure, including the networking, to support very specific workloads and traffic patterns. So they're looking for that minute, de de minute detail, that minute level of programmability and control. Versus your traditional enterprise, uh, I heard a comparison recently where one of the hyperscale guys had two applications and a financial services customer had over a thousand applications that they had to worry about on a daily basis impacting yeah. their network. Mike yeah, if I could actually comment on that. So, you know, yeah, it's a key point in, in the research note that I wrote uh, on networking and hyperscale environment, which we said, you know, those hyperscale guys, you know, they've got a big group of PhDs, and they will actually spend a lot of their time and, you know, thought doll, you know, thought to build that configuration, and it's very custom. So they, they yes. spend that time to save money as opposed to the enterprise. The enterprise is overworked, and they've got so much legacy baggage and so many applications that they need to, uh, you know, spend money to help them save time. So yes. I, I think that kind of sums it up. We, we do a little pyramid, which if you go to wikibon.org and look at the software-led infrastructure uh, page, you know, we, we've got a lot of pieces. But yeah, please, please continue on that note. No, absolutely, and your comments are right in line. These hyperscale young companies with lots of PhDs, it's like one big science experiment. They're trying to build the biggest, fastest network they can with no constraints from their legacy. And so they have the luxury of designing from the ground up versus an enterprise that has you know, 30, 40% of their IT budget going towards maintenance of their existing environment. And they're constrained by that. They, they have an inability to innovate as quickly. 
And there's also this natural inclination to buy uh, commercial software and hardware that comes with support contracts because there's security in that and it lowers their risk. So it's, it's a risk reward ratio, it's a legacy versus build from the ground up ratio. So there's a lot of constraints that are inherent in the enterprise as well. Yeah, yeah, Mike, it's interesting. If, if I think about how the enterprise builds something, you know, they're very risk adverse. And while a network needs to be built uh, so that components can fail and things can fail over and they can reroute and everything, typically they want to build it with such an architecture that nothing ever breaks. <laughs> As opposed to the hyperscale guys I find, uh, you know, you take the Netflix model, they build in what they call the chaos monkey, uh, where, you know, inherent in the system, everything's going to break, everything's going to change, and, and it's, it's kind of a different mindset. Is, yeah. is, is that some of the discussion you're having too? Oh, absolutely. You look at that scale out type model where I've got millions of components across the infrastructure, and when one breaks, I simply pull it out, replace it, and walk off versus trying to maintain that particular server or storage module. It's, it's definitely a different mindset that you see in that hyperscale community. Yeah, yeah, very different mindset. When you think about, you know, they want shorter refresh cycles, uh, they, they need want cheaper components, as opposed to the enterprise wants to make fewer purchases, they want whatever they buy to squeeze as much out of it, keep it as long as possible, as, as opposed to the hyperscale guys. They want, yeah. they want it to be upgraded faster because um, then they can take advantage of new technologies and new scales, and they're going to they're, they're going to keep building on top of it. Uh, so, so, Mike, uh, when we talk about networking, of course, we have to talk about uh, software-defined networks, or sure. SDN. Um, and you know, I definitely have heard some of the big companies, you know, leading some of the SDN environments. Um, I, I, you know, Google is a great example that I've seen. You know, they've been using, you know, some of the tools that make up uh, some of the SDN toolkit. Uh, you know, for a few years now. Uh, can you tell us, you know, wh what are you seeing out there? What's really real today in SDN, um, and, and how does that fit into kind of the hyperscale and the enterprise environments? It's like asking what's real in cloud computing. <laughs> You know, SDN is a concept, and within that concept, there are a lot of practical uh, components that can be implemented. So you see in the infrastructure that's called SDN, this extrapolation of the control layer from the, the data layer, and in between that, you've got a layer of APIs that will manage traffic north and south, and up on top of it, you've got uh, capability to add in additional services. So there's a lot of complexity there and different companies are attacking that at different layers. So we see through things such as OpenFlow, there's the protocol in the middle that will allow you to uh, manage the, the control layer and OpenStack I think is, is one of the, the big innovators that's looking at the top to bottom stack including SDN and that will, will create a framework for which all of this can fit into. And a lot of the vendors are beginning to develop towards the various components of that infrastructure. But, but looking at F SDN holistically, it's, it's still more of the, the concept of how you extrapolate those services away from the physical hardware underneath and allow it to be managed heterogeneously. And there's lots of ways you can accomplish that. Yeah, so, so, so Mike, I, I got to poke, because uh, you, know, you, you mentioned cloud there. So uh, I, I think we, we've made progress in cloud because you know, there are numbers of solutions out there that uh, you know, are doing great in revenue. So yeah. you know, Amazon Web Services, you know, over $3 billion last year. Sure. SaaS applications, everybody's using them. Sure. Um, so some of the private environments, you know, maybe you can have a little bit of a point there. Yeah. So it's part of the problem that we don't have a clear leading solution, and I, I would, you know, differentiate between there's lots of pieces of SDN. Yeah. Um, Cisco, uh, you know, has their ACI, which has just recently come to market. Uh, VMware has NSX, um, which has been on the market a little bit more, but still hasn't fully transitioned from when they acquired to Nasira to a full VMware product. Um, and then there's lots of other players working on pieces. So, you know, I, I, I can't look to anything and say, you know, there's a thousand of those pieces deployed out there. No, uh, it's always that, the definition. Not at the maturity yet. Yeah. No, sorry, it's always the definitional issue. What is SDN and, and whose definition of SDN is the right definition? So I think there's work going on in the standards community and the, the communities out there to, to try to settle on a single definition, much like they had to do with cloud computing in the past, which is where my comments came from. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, please finish, finish up. Uh, as the definitions settle and become agreed upon, the various components that make up SDN uh, can progress from proprietary solutions to more open solutions that interact with each other in open ways. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And actually, in your opening statement, Mike, you mentioned open source. And I think that's going to be key here because, you know, we can't wait for the traditional standards bodies to move these forward. It's going to take too long. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I worked on, you know, Fiber Channel and iSCSI and Fiber Channel over Ethernet. And, you know, those, t you know, take years to right. go through the standards body to get complete. Uh, you, you know, you mentioned OpenStack. But, you know, OpenStack Neutron is being worked on by, you know, lots of companies. Uh, there, there's code in place that people can take today uh, and do things with, and lots of people are coding to, to make it better. And, and OpenStack, too, is lots of different projects being worked on by, you know, thousands of people. Um, and, and try to put those pieces together. So, um, you know, hopefully we will go through that kind of storming, norming, and forming a little bit faster this time. Uh, and, and I think open source is a, is a key component of that. Absolutely, and, and I agree with your, your comments. And I think we will move progressively faster through each of these iterations because the, the market's demanding it. And there seems to be a lot of market participation in things such as OpenStack. So, yes, it's a vendor-led community and there's a lot of vendor activity, but there's actual end users in the community who are helping to refine and define this. Yeah, a absolutely. So, uh, you know, we had we had the Cube at OpenStack Summit. I, I was really excited to be there. We did a ton of interviews. Um, is, is Emulex uh, an active participant in, in the OpenStack effort? Yeah, so Emulex is, is active in the OpenStack community, and our products are all supported in the OpenStack environment. So there's a lot more to come. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, speaking of Emulex, you know, I, I've worked with Emulex for many years, and most people, you know, understand that Emulex has a strong heritage in storage networking. Yes. And if I look, storage networking in, in many ways is separate from you know, the rest of networking. Um, you know, can, can you talk to us as, you know, is this new, you know, revolution in networking going to change that? Are we going to finally have, you know, full convergence? Uh, you know, what, what, what do you see as the change there and how, how does storage networking fit into uh, this whole discussion? Sure. A absolutely. Our, our heritage is from the networking side of things, long-time heritage in the fiber channel area with block storage capabilities. And that's actually how we got into the Ethernet side of networking as an FCOE vendor a number of years ago. And from that, we realized that there's a larger opportunity and there's a lot more innovation going on across the board in the Ethernet networking space. In fact, Ethernet is, is really the the most flexible networking backbone in existence today because it allows you to converge all of these different workloads, storage, virtualization, uh, rocky RDMA, low latency type applications on top. So all of these are converging on that one backbone called Ethernet or TCP IP more importantly. And it has become the, the backbone of choice for convergence of all of these enterprise workloads. And that's what led us to become a networking vendor, not just a storage vendor. Okay, uh, when we specifically talking a little bit about the hyperscale guys, how important is networking in the architectures that they build? Networking is critical because the, the concept of any business is that I use my compute infrastructure to run applications that will provide business intelligence to people to make decisions. It's all about the application. And when you run applications, inherently you require the underlying compute, storage, and network infrastructure to do that. Well, we've always scaled the compute and storage infrastructure pretty quickly over time as applications became more complex. And the network has, has typically been that poor stepchild. So with the advent of 10 gig Ethernet and convergence of more technologies on top of 10 gig Ethernet, there seems to be a lot more concern about the ability of the network to scale and, and meet the needs of even more workloads on top of it. So networking is a very critical component of that hyperscale community. Yeah, Mike, can you give us any examples of how uh, scalability and you know, agility are built into the, being built into the networking products? Sure, absolutely. Uh, as we mentioned, 10 gig is, is the latest innovation in Ethernet, but 40 gig Ethernet is, is available. It's beginning to be deployed within a lot of the core networks for enterprises and some of these hyperscale companies. 
and slowly creeping out to the edge. So the 100 gig standard is, is coming down the pike. So Ethernet is continuing to, to grow in its ability to provide bigger bandwidth, higher IOPS, and, and more transaction throughput. So the scalability is, is happening over time. But on top of that, within the pipe, there's also more of an ability to carve up your network and provide better quality of service and provide lower latency for applications so that they can get better end user experience performance. Okay, yeah, now obviously I uh, understand we've always got kind of the, the, the leaps and bounds that are going on in performance. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, scale out architectures are something that are discussed a lot. Sure. Um, you know, Arista recently IPO'd uh, and, you know, they're kind of known for being in, you know, not just the high performance computing environments, but bringing that scale out type of architecture right. uh, to enterprise environments. So, you know, anything else you're seeing in that space that kind of makes, uh, you know, I mean, some of it's just, you know, the box design, um, but uh, yeah, anything you want to comment on kind of scale out? Yes, I think there's a huge move to build scale out architectures. If you look back to the, the, the typical high performance computing market, that was, was kind of the beginning of a scale out architecture where you could put hundreds or thousands of small nodes into a compute cluster and very rapidly uh, calculate things by spreading the operations across multiple nodes. Well, if you take that same concept and apply it to enterprise type applications, you can do similar things in an enterprise network by putting more computer storage nodes together, clustering them, and spreading the workload across multiple nodes in a compute cluster, which leads to needing the same type of, of network performance and scalability and agility that you used to have in this high performance environment in your typical enterprise network environment. Okay, um, you know, this, beyond scale out, the other piece that, you know, typically is, is being discussed, especially if you talk to service providers or the large enterprise environments, um, is they want to act a little bit more like the hyperscale guys, and therefore um, they might want to, you know, build things specific for, for their applications, be able to sure. customize things, or, you know, it just the role of developers in general has, you know, really grown in the IT space. Uh, you know, how what, what's the impact of that whole, you know, developer and, uh, you know, application focus on, on, on networking? Sure. Well, my, uh, my dirty little secret is I started in the world as a mainframe programmer, and uh, my company's first token ring lay and sat on my desk. So I, I did a little bit of networking and, comp and developing in my early days, so understand that. Uh, again, developers are all about building applications, and building applications is all about trying to build the best performing application that you can to run on the compute infrastructure that you have. So uh, traditionally in a mainframe environment, we didn't have to worry too much about that. You built the application and the mainframe and the, the FICON environment handled any uh, type of networking needs that you had. But as we've moved to more of these scale out networks, it's much more important to develop applications that are efficient and that can take advantage of the compute and networking capabilities to uh, execute more efficiently, to get data where it needs to be more efficiently, and analyze data more efficiently. So there's a marriage of that development process with the networking capabilities that are underneath the infrastructure you're going to deploy it on. And that's exactly what the telcos are trying to achieve, is they have to scale out these environments that will be able to serve up uh, hundreds or millions of little iPhone applications that are all using APIs to tie into other iPhone applications to get data so they can make a decision. Uh, you know, my client just checked in on Foursquare at the coffee shop around the corner, so I want to send them an alert that I have a sale on an item that they would typically buy. There's a whole lot of compute that needs to happen for that little transaction. And the telcos are, are right in the middle of providing all of the infrastructure and services for that type of a, a transaction to occur. Okay. Uh, wow, Mike. Uh, you know, so, so many pieces of that. So first of all, um, you mentioned telcos. So uh, we haven't touched on you know the other kind of you know hot topic uh, in the environment, which is network function virtualization or NFV. Um, you know, from my standpoint, um, NFV came on a little bit after SDN. A lot of people have been trying to figure out you know how they uh, you know compare and contrast, and, and we've written a couple of articles on that because they are kind of different solution sets. Um, but you know. 
the, the products and the revenue for the solutions that fit under that NFV bucket have actually uh, you know, taken off faster than some of the SDN pieces have. As, as you said, we're still trying to define SDN. Um, you know, what, what, what are you seeing uh, from, from the NFV and uh, kind of the telco carrier space? Sure, absolutely. We see that there's extreme growth in that uh, market, that the telcos are having to deal with the explosion of this new traffic from the internet of everything, if you will. Any device you can imagine having uh, networking capabilities and sending information across the provider network. And as that traffic and the demand for service grows, they have to build networks and environments that will scale to handle that. And their traditional forms of providing and monitoring and managing that network are breaking. They, uh, they used to invest in specialty appliances for WAN optimization or for a deep packet inspection or content distribution networks, what have you, the old ATCA appliances that you bought as a, a complete appliance and plugged into your network. And as they're trying to build a more virtualized and scalable environment, they are working with the providers of those former appliances to build them as smaller virtual appliances. And we're right in the middle of that with some of the, uh, the work that we're doing in that community to provide some capabilities to develop and supply these very scalable, fast packet processing applications that a telecommunication company can can use to provide these these services to their customers. Okay, wow, that, that that's uh, that's fascinating, Mike. Um, the other piece we, we talked about appliances are moving over to software. Um, yes. While so much of the discussions around software these days, one of the interesting kind of hardware related item is uh, you know the the open compute uh, initiative. So. Okay. Um, you know, what are you hearing about OCP and, uh, you, you know, I, I know Emulix has a, has a solution that fits in there, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. We, we introduced our open compute networking adapters and con converged network adapters at, earlier this year at Interop, and we're working with a number of the, the server manufacturers, the o OCP infrastructure suppliers to provide this capability. And it comes down to uh, enterprises and web scales and telcos who are trying to build a standardized compute environment, whether it's the software with open source or whether it's your hardware with an open compute server or open compute networking now, uh, all of the various components that you can put together for an open compute platform. And we see that there's growth in that area. A uh, number of companies are still playing around with it to make sure that it's real and that they can run their workloads on that environment and scale the environment quickly and get servers that still bring them the, the uh, uh, reliability, security, robustness that they need. Uh, but we see that there's a, a, a real future in that and that there seems to be growth in that area as well. Wow. Uh, you know, so Mike, you know, one of the things that always strikes me is there, there's probably more change going on in the networking space now than there has been at least in the last 15 years, uh, yes. probably put together. Um, you know, what, what are you hearing from CIOs today? You know, how are they, are they, you know, just buried in this sea of, you know, buzzwords and, you know, new projects coming on? Are they starting to wrap their heads around it? You know, how, how does Emulex have that conversation? Are you doing anything to help retrain the workforce to, you know, bring them up to speed on some of these things? Sure, there's, there's definitely still a lot of buzzword bingo going on out there in the IT organization. But the reality is the, the CIO is, is trying to cut costs. They're trying to reduce the spend and increase their ability to provide these services to their own internal customers. Uh, we, we see, we call this the Amazoning of IT where uh, somebody can go to Amazon and with a, a very few clicks they can get a complete infrastructure, a complete compute infrastructure with, including storage. And in your own IT organization, to get that similar compute and storage takes a number of POs, a number of weeks to order and, and receive and install and provision the equipment. And so the IT organization is under pressure to implement the private cloud, where they can look and act like an Amazon.com to their own internal organizations and provide them very rapidly provisioned compute storage and network where they can bring up new workloads in you know minutes or hours instead of days and weeks okay so so like since, since you wear a marketing hat uh you know i i need to ask you the question about emulex 
Uh, you know, when I said, you know, you, you guys obviously had a strong heritage in storage networking. You, you've got, you know, uh, products and software and services around the networking. Um, but a, a lot of people probably think of Emulex as a company that, you know, makes, you know, chips and cards. Um, in the, the world of hyperscale um, and, and SDN and all these changes going on, you know, how, how should we be thinking of Emulex going forward? Sure. sure. Emulex is absolutely a leader in storage and storage networking. But you probably didn't know that Emulex is the number two provider of 10 gig Ethernet in the industry as well, uh, primarily through our OEM relationships with all of the large server and storage OEMs. So Emulex equals Ethernet. We are a networking vendor. We provide core networking capabilities for enterprises, for hyperscale, uh, for any environment. And we also see that there's tremendous growth in the, the need as these networks scale to now monitor and uh, uh, provide security in these networks. So Emulex is also active in the monitoring and security space with an acquisition we made about 18 months ago where we can do real-time packet capture and analysis. So you should see Emulex as a holistic networking vendor providing endpoint access and security for enterprise and hyperscale networks. All right, well, hey, Mike, I really help, help, I appreciate you helping us you know, sort through the buzzword bingo, and on your bingo card, you actually get a bonus chip because you worked in a mention of token ring, uh, which always gets <laughs> the old school networking people all excited. Uh, so, so, so Mike J uh, from, from Emulex, I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time, sharing all this. Uh, this is Stu Miniman uh, with Wikibon, when this has been a CUBE conversation. Uh, go to wikibon.org slash SLI, which is software-led infrastructure. Uh, check out much more research on uh, everything going on in uh, SDN, NFB, and everything else there. Uh, and uh, emulex.com is uh, you know where Emulex is. We appreciate them joining us for this segment. Uh, hope you come back and uh, check us out for more CUBE conversations in the future. Thanks, Steve. All right. <laughs>